concluding our series this morning on We Are the Church. And over the course of the last couple of weeks, we've examined the purpose of the church, what the church is supposed to be, what it is not. Uh, the church is a place to serve. Uh, we looked at last week of church is a place to be connected. And this morning, we're going to look at this truth that we are to live on mission for the kingdom of God. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 10. We'll be starting and reading verses 14 and 15. Let me go, let me go up to 13. 13 is a good one. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we pray this morning? We thank God for it. Father, we, we thank you that this word is anointed by you. It has been breathed out by you and it is useful for us. Lord, I pray that as we examine this truth in this passage of Scripture, that, God, you would speak to our hearts and that, Lord, you would ignite a passion, Lord, to, to live on mission for the kingdom of God, understanding that, Lord, there is a, a world that is longing to hear of the good news. They are longing to see a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. And, Father, we, your body, God, I pray that you would cause us to, to take of the of the time in which we live and understand that the, the time of working is drawing to an end. And Lord, may we be faithful at bringing in the harvest while it is still day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Being in Northwest Iowa, it's harvest season, right? I mean, and when it's harvest season, everything stops to get the crops from the field into the, the, the combine and into where that needs to go. Uh, I mean, it's just important, right? I mean, all hands on deck. There are quite a few times we're driving and, you know, I don't know if one, if one of the farmers is having a, a, a difficulty with his combine because usually there's one just kind of in the middle of the field. I'm thinking that's kind of an odd way, a place to park your combine. But what I'm thinking is there's probably some trouble. But you know what is interesting? A little bit down acreage a little bit more, there's a combine still working that field. Now, maybe that farmer's combine was acting up and maybe he just didn't want to work that day, but that didn't stop the farmer from bringing in the harvest. Maybe he called a friend of his and borrowed it, or maybe they saw that he was in need and they took their combine over to help uh, harvest the field. The point is, we understand in the natural sense that, you know, the harvest is important. Uh, and that everything stops for the harvest. And it doesn't matter. I mean, some of those combines go, I mean, it's dark out and they're out there, right? Early in the morning, they're out there. Um, I don't know if they take an hour lunch break or not. I don't know. I mean, all I know is that they are motivated and driven to get the harvest out of the fields. The same must be true for the church. We understand you can look in, in nature around us that, you know, we can start seeing that, you know, the corn in the middle of the summer is just absolutely beautiful. There's nothing more beautiful than a cornfield. But after a while, that, that green in the corn starts turning more of a, a brown and a goldish color, right? And you know when you see that, that the harvest is coming. When the, when the temperatures start, you know, being a little bit more brisk in the morning, you know that harvest is around the corner. When the days get shorter, right? I mean, I love summer, nine o'clock, and it's it's bright outside. But as you get closer to the harvest, the days get shorter. And Jesus said that we must work while it is still day, because night comes when no man can work. The church must understand that there is a harvest. In fact, Jesus says to look up. 
and to see the fields, see that they are white unto harvest, that it is ready. And our mission, our goal is that we would pray that the Lord would send forth laborers. I understand this, that when you start praying that God would send forth laborers, he takes that as your volunteering to be a laborer. Right? Well, the moment you say, Lord, send laborers into your harvest field, God says, great, I'll send them, starting with you. And I think that maybe that's why we don't pray for the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers, because we know that by doing that, we are enlisting into his service and to bring in the harvest. And yet that is still the mandate that we must have and understand is that we are called to pray for the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers and that it would start with us. Every believer has been given a mission by God to advance his kingdom. Every believer. Oftentimes, and this is where we've messed up in the church, is we've looked at advancing the kingdom or being missions minded and, and driven, that that is for the professionals to do. Right? We have our professional missionaries, and, and we've blessed many of them as they've come in and shared what God is doing. And, and so we, we give to our missions. And to our missionaries and we send them out and oftentimes we think that that's the end that it's for them to do and not for us to do but we have to understand that every believer has been given a mission by God and that is to advance his kingdom each one of us must do the work of an evangelist Paul says every one of us has been called to people that are in our lives in order to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them every Christian is a missionary one of the worst things that we've ever done was separate the vocation of ministry from the, the practice and the application of ministry. And one of the things that the Reformation tried to bring about was this, this complete tearing down of the hierarchy of the vocation and everybody else. That if I'm not called to be vocationally a pastor or evangelist or missionary or teacher, then somehow that excuses me from my responsibility to be a missionary, to pastor people that God has placed in my life, to evangelize and to teach and to instruct people. But every Christian is a missionary, regardless of vocation or location. Every one, everywhere needs to hear about the good news of Jesus. We don't, we can't leave it up to the professionals to do it all. The task is too great. The, 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 the harvest is too large for just the professional, just for the vocational aspect of ministry. But every believer, you've been called to the people in your life. Now think about the people that are in your sphere of influence. Those people that are in your world. I may never meet them. And if I do meet them, it will take me years to develop a relationship where I can speak into their life. But lo and behold, God has a remedy for that problem. You, you are the answer to that problem because you already have a relationship with them. You already have influence in their life. You can already speak into their life because they will hear you because they already know you. And those are the people that God has called you to reach. Those are the people that God has called you to shepherd, to pastor. By definition, being a Christian is to be Christ-like. In fact, it was a derogatory word that was given to us that we were little Christ. And the church took that as a badge of honor and said, exactly, that is what we're called to be. We are called to be like Christ. And if Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, then our mission is nothing less than that, to bring the lost to a saving knowledge and faith in Christ Jesus. We are to follow the example of Christ. Jesus tells us a parable of the lost sheep. And I've never owned sheep. I like eating them. They're tasty. You know, you get some rosemary on there. And, and I mean, it, you know, it, it's a good meal. But I don't, I, I've never raised sheep. Um, and so I kind of, when I hear the story of the lost sheep, I'm thinking, why would any shepherd go to great lengths for a stinking sheep when you got 99 over there right he's not going hungry he's got 99 why would why the one and then i came across a modern day parable of the lost dog now i have a dog all right i love my dog 
Um, I was cuddling up next to Sophie last night, just on the floor. And she, her eyes were just closed, and I was just rubbing her ears. She just, and her ears are so velvety soft. And, and I just, and Manny goes, wow, you really love your dog. I'm thinking, but she loves me back. <laughs> right? She lo- and not that my Manny doesn't love me back, but I do know this. If I were to put both of them in a trunk and come back five hours later, there's only one that would be happy to see me. <laughs> Am I right? Only one. And it's not Manny. She wouldn't be happy to see me at that moment. So I understand losing a dog. That would be devastating. Well, there's a story from the New York Times back in 2019. I'm not going to read the, the article, but uh, it's about this lady... Uh, who lost her dog, and it just, the, the Border Collie, Katie's the name of the dog, ran away, okay? And she, you know, again, was, was upset and distraught that, hey, my dog got lost. Uh, but the, 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 the article goes on and it says, over the next 57 days, 57, the couple set out on a, vis- on a desperate search that included night vision goggles, about an investment. Those don't come cheap. Animal tracking cameras and horse manure brought in from the family's farm in eastern Washington. Miss King, a postal carrier, eventually quit her job in order to search for her dog. That's a modern day parable of the lost sheep. 57 days invested all of this equipment to find a dog. But if you've ever had a dog, you understand that when they're not there, there's something missing in your life. There is a bond between a a person and their pet. And this lady, eventually, because she was looking for her dog so much that her work was in was creating a problem. She couldn't look for a dog when she's out delivering the mail, working in the post office. One had to go. It wasn't her dog or searching for her dog. After 57 days, they finally found the dog. It had lost about 15 pounds, and uh, not sure how it survived that long uh, in the wilderness, but they eventually found the dog and the joy. And as I read this, I just immediately thought of the parable that Jesus told about the lost sheep and the lost coin, that at the end there was such joy and celebration because of all, and and again, the, the, the energy that they did to find the lost sheep, the energy that was spent to find that lost coin did not matter one bit once they found the lost sheep or the lost coin, or in this situation, the lost dog. All of those sacrifices was worth it to find that which was lost. If a woman would go to such great lengths to get her dog back, how much more can you imagine a loving father doing whatever is necessary to seek and to save the lost? We are given these stories to show us the love that the father has for those who are lost. And we should read these stories, and it should help us understand that God goes all out into reaching those who are lost. And if he went all out to reach the lost, which at one point you and I were in that number, how much more, as we've been saved, as we've been found, that we are motivated, that we are driven by that same love and sacrifice to go all out to bring those who are lost back into the fold, to bring in the harvest. Our text this morning so powerfully asks, and Paul does a wonderful way of asking these questions, how can they call on him in whom they've not believed? I mean, he was looking at all those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so he begins to ask this question, how can they call upon him to be saved and to believe in him if they've never heard of him? And how can they hear unless somebody tells them? 
And then he goes on, he says, well, how can they tell them unless they've been sent, unless they've been commissioned? And oftentimes we read this in light of vocational missionaries, right? That we send out our missionaries. But I want us to look at this from a different perspective, from God's perspective, not our perspective. Our perspective is, yeah, they must be sent out. Let's send out missionaries from among us to go to the far reaches of the world and to spread the gospel. But this verse is looking not from our perspective, but from God's perspective. That there's a mass of humanity all around us that need to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ. How can they hear? How can they believe if they don't hear? And how can they hear if nobody tells them? And how can they be told if no one is sent? So Jesus says, I will send them. We see that in Matthew chapter 28, right? Go ye therefore into all the world. It's a great commission because we've been commissioned. We've been sent out. To all the world. Paul answers, the answer to Paul's question, how can they call on him whom they not believe? How can they believe on him if they've never heard? And how can they hear without someone telling them? The simple answer is they cannot. They cannot believe unless they hear, and they cannot hear unless someone tells them, and they cannot be told unless they are sent. And we've been commissioned to go. We are the sent out ones. We have been called to take this message to all those who we come in contact with. we got to understand missions is not just something that happens on the other side of the globe, where a person leaves their country and their culture and their language, and they learn a new language and adapt a new culture and reach people. That's not missions. Missions is every single one of us telling every single person that comes into our life that God would bring into our lives about the good news of Jesus Christ and living in such a way that they see Christ in us, demonstrated through us, not just by the words that we say, but by the actions and by the life that we live. We've been sent out. We've been called to make a difference in those that we come in contact with. We've been called and sent out to be fishers of men. Isn't that what he told the disciples? Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of of men. I want to tell you a story about a group of people who fancied themselves to be fishermen. They lived in an area that was populated with lakes, rivers, streams, and ponds. The lakes, rivers, streams, and ponds were filled with all kinds of freshwater fish, and the fish were hungry and would bite at almost any kind of bait. Week after week, month after month, year after year, these people who called themselves fishermen held meetings and talked about their call to be fishermen. They talked about the abundance of fish and the latest innovations in technology and fishing trends. They were careful to articulate what fishing was all about, to defend fishing as a noble occupation, and passionately declared that fishing is always the primary task of fishermen. They were constantly scouring the landscape, searching for new and better methods of fishing. They loved such slogans as, fishing is the primary task of every fisherman. They sponsored special meetings known as Fisherman's Campaigns. They went on a nationwide and even a worldwide tour to discuss and promote fishing and to, and to hear all the new developments and technological developments in fishing. They even had exhaustive sessions on how to present the bait to the fish and new ways to make the bait more attractive and more alluring to the fish. They built large, beautiful buildings called Fishing Headquarters and selected some of their best fishermen to staff it. They appealed to everyone to become fishermen. There was only one thing they did not do. Fish. Ever. In addition to organizing and holding regularly scheduled meetings, they organized a board to oversee the fishing headquarters and to send fishermen out to other parts of the world where the fish were equally plentiful and available. The board appointed various committees and held numerous fishing meetings to talk about fishing, to defend fishing, and develop new strategies for fishing. But the overseers of the fishing headquarters, the staff, the board, or the communities never went fishing. Large, expensive training centers known as fishing schools were built for the purpose of teaching fishermen how to fish. They offered courses on the needs of fish, the, the nature of fish, the ancestral backgrounds of fish, the psychological makeup of fish, and how to approach and feed fish. Professors all had degrees in fishology, but none of them ever went fishing. After completing the course of study, the graduates were given a fishing license and were sent out to fish full time. 
Some decided to fish locally, others moved away from their local surroundings, and still others went to distant lands to fish. They in turn trained and commissioned others to fish. Like the fishermen back home, they often talked for hours on the need to fish, the current trends of fishing and how to fish. Even though it was really their heart's desire to fish, these new fishermen became too busy to actually fish. Because they were too busy to fish, they recruited others to fish, called them recruits or disciples. They furnished fishing equipment. They also taught their fishing disciples to develop good relationships with the fish so that the fish would be more receptive to other fishermen. After one stirring meeting, the necessity of fishing, one young fellow left the meeting and actually went fishing. At the next fisherman's meeting, he reported an outstanding catch. He was honored for his excellent catch, and immediately a nationwide tour was scheduled so that he could motivate others to go fishing. In order to have time for these motivational meetings, he was forced to disperse to dispense with full-time fishing and become a recreational fisherman. He became so successful on the motivational circuit that he was called upon to serve on the Fisherman's General Board, which consumed so much time that he had no time for fishing at all. Now, it is true that many of the fishermen made personal sacrifices and tolerated all kinds of difficulties. Some lived near the water and had to bear the smell of dead and decaying fish all the time. They were even ridiculed by some who were constantly making fun of their fishermen clubs. What they did not realize was that the reason they were being ridiculed was because they were always talking about fishing but never fishing. People outside fishing circles actually wondered if all this talk and no action might possibly be a waste of the fishermen's time. Now imagine how deeply they were hurt when someone suggested that those who don't fish are not actually fishermen. And you, hopefully you got the point of the, the story, right? We talk about winning souls and the churches are here to do it, but, but do we do it? Here's some things to ponder, some questions to ponder. Are we really interested in fishing? Are we really interested in winning the, the lost souls to Christ? Is fishing a priority in our lives? Is advancing the kingdom of God important? Would we rather fish or watch others fish? If we're so interested in fishing, then where are our fish? These are the things that we have to ask ourselves. We say it as a church, and we all know this, the Great Commission. We all know that the purpose of the church is to, is to reach out to the lost and to bring them in. But here's the, the thing that we have to ask ourselves. Are we really true to what we're saying that we're true to? I don't fish. I have some fishing poles, but I don't fish. Can I really call myself a fisherman just because I have a fishing pole? No, right? I mean, that's the answer. No, I really can't. I, 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 can I call myself a church just because I have a Bible? Can I call myself a believer just because I attend a church? If we're not doing what God has called us to do. We have to ask ourselves the hard questions. And then we either have to do one or two things. We can continue doing what we've always done and nothing changes. Or we can say, I've got to change. How horrible it is to be a part of a fishing group and never go fishing. How horrible it is to be a part of a church and never go out and to advance the kingdom of God. We are fast approaching the return of Christ. Every day that comes goes by, we are one day closer to the return of Christ. And it is no longer acceptable to merely enjoy the idea of fishing. Rather, we must engage in fishing for men. We talked about the harvest at the beginning. If we truly believe that the harvest was ready to be harvested, what kind of farmers would we be if we stayed in home? Well, it's, it's a little chilly out this morning. I mean, are you going to fault me for not getting in the combine today? What, what good are you as a farmer if the harvest is there? You worked, you planted. Now's the time to bring it in, and you're just like, oh, I'm just going to sleep in. I, you know, I'm really going to miss the cornfields if I harvest them, right? I mean... The golden stalks look so autumnly, right? I mean, it just looks like October outside when you see them. And it just, you know, the wife lights her pumpkin latte as she looks at the, at the golden stalks of the corn. I, I'm just going to stay in. We, if, if a farmer did that, we would all say, you're crazy. You don't deserve the fields that were entrusted to you. 
We know that the return of Christ is drawing near. We understand that there will be a day when we won't be able to go out into the harvest and bring them in. It'll be too late. Just as Noah went and his family went into the ark and the, and the Lord shut the door, there was a day when it was too late. And no matter the knocking, the crying, the hearing of people drowning and dying on the outside, nothing could bring them in once the door was closed. We have to understand that the return of Christ is fast approaching and darkness comes when no man will be able to work, Jesus said. And so we must be diligent. We must be motivated. Be inspired by the farmers around in our community who are out there for all hours of the day bringing in the harvest. I mean, everything stops in order to bring that harvest in. Their family stops. Their livelihood stops. Everything stops to bring in that harvest. How much more should we be motivated with that same tenacity? Because our harvest is an eternal harvest. Christianity Today, a few years ago, published the following statistic. 160 million people in the United States are unchurched. Unchurched is being defined as going to church two times or less in one year. 160 million people. Again, we send out our missionaries around the world, and we'll continue to do that. But we don't do that in exchange for not doing anything here. 160 million Americans in this country that one nation under God, in God we trust, 160 million people are considered unchurched. 96% or 153 million people would go to church if they were invited. When I saw this, it blows my mind. So you're saying that the only 96% are waiting for a personal invitation? Not a, here's the Romans Road or the ABCs of salvation, just a, hey, would you come to church with me? 96% said that they would go. Think about this. 160 million people in the in the country considered unchurched. 153 million said that they would go to church if they were invited. The majority of the unchurched would go if they were invited. Only 21% of churchgoers invite anyone to church and in the course of a year. 21% of churchgoers invite anyone. 96% are waiting for an invitation. Only 21% are invited. Only 2% of church goers invite an unchurched person to attend church with them in the course of a year. What does an unchurched person consider to be an invitation? Simple. You ready? I would like to invite you to church. Wow, that's deep. That's what they consider an invitation that they're waiting for. I would like to invite you to attend my church. For some, it's an invitation by the believer to meet the unchurched at the church to sit with them. So when you say, hey, I would like for you to attend the church, and you know what? You can sit with me. For some, it's an invitation on the part of the believer to show the unchurched person around the church facilities. And when you get here, I'll show you around. Because everybody needs to know where the bathroom is. There's nothing worse than being in a new facility, new place, and you're looking for where the bathroom is. It's like a scavenger hunt. Some of the stores, they hide there, and it's like, I'm going down every aisle around the perimeter of the room trying to find, and it's like, just show me a sign or just point my, the way so that you can invite them. Say, I'll sit with you, and you know what? I'll show you around. For some, it was an invitation to be extended by the believer to the unchurched to sit with them during the service, then meet for a meal at a local restaurant following the service. And oh, by the way, lunch is on me. That's how simple it is. Invite those that maybe, maybe... Well, they, they're not interested. Invite them. Say, hey, would you come to church with me? You can sit with me or not. Maybe they don't want to sit with me, right? I, you know, hey, you can sit. I'll save a seat six feet apart, right? Because we're going to social distance. I'll show you around. And you know what? I'll take you out for lunch. It is time for Christians, for you and I, to drop the line. I'm not a great fisherman. I've only went a few times, but you know what? I have caught more fish when I drop the line in the water than if I don't. Now, I'm not to say that I got fish every time I drop the line in the water, but my my per, my percentage of catching fish astronomically increased when I would put the line in the water than when I just held it on the boat or on the shoreline and I just thought, "Oh, it would be nice if the fish just jumped out." fall in my little bucket here. That doesn't happen. you got to 
throughout the line. And again, I understand, because we don't like to get rejected. You invite people, and I've invited people in, and they say, yeah, I'll be there, and then they don't show up, and you're like, ugh. And it's not a good feeling, but you know what I've found? Again, I'm not a fisherman, but I've looked and watched people that have gone fishing, that when they put their line in, they don't get anything out. You know what they do? They cast it again. And they keep casting it until they get fish. That's probably why I'm not a good fisherman. I quit too easily. Cast it in. Uh, fish aren't biting today. I just threw it in once. You know, apparently, they're not biting. Persistence. Tenacity. Keep going. Keep dropping the line. Keep throwing the net. In closing, the philosophical stance of the church must be that the Great Commission is personal. The Great Commission isn't just to the church overall, general, but it's personal. It's where Jesus is saying to you, I have called you to go into all the world and make disciples. That that is where we fail. We see the Great Commission, that it's the responsibility of the church, but we've never taken that and applied it to our life, that we have been commissioned. An auto repair shop cannot survive without repairing automobiles. A carpenter cannot survive without something to build. A bank cannot make money unless it lends out money, right? Unless it does banking. A hospital cannot stay in business without patients. We learned that with COVID, right? They, everything shut down. All nothing great medical needs you have to wait because they didn't want to be overloaded. And guess what? Even in our local hospital, they had to go on to part time because there were no patients. The church cannot survive if she fails in the Great Commission. If all these other entities can't survive without doing what they were purposed and created to do, then the same is true for the church. We cannot survive if we fail at the Great Commission. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. First, Lord, we thank you that we were the lost ones. We were the lost sheep. We were the lost coin. We were the lost border collie that you went to great lengths to find and to restore. Father, we thank you for that. But Lord, I pray that as those who were once lost and are now found, Lord, I pray that we would be motivated to seek and to bring those who are lost in our lives so that they may be found by you, so that you can redeem them, so that you can save them and place your spirit within them. Lord, help us to see that this great commission isn't just a corporate uh, call for the church, but Lord, it is an individual call, a mandate for each one of us who put our faith in you that we have been sent out to answer Paul's question in our text. They can't hear, they can't believe unless someone tells them, and then they can't be told unless they have been sent out. And Lord, we know that you've sent us out. The people that you bring into our lives are brought into our lives so that we could be a light unto them. Help us, God, to live this gospel in front of them. Help us, God, to open up our mouth and that, Lord, you would fill that mouth with your words. That, Lord, that would bring them to a place of repentance so that they would confess their sin and declare that you're the king of their life. God, I pray in Jesus' name, may we not just be an organization that talks about fishing, but, Lord, may we be actively fishing and bringing in the harvest. We ask this in Jesus' name. Now may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. In the wonderful name of Jesus.